Okay, the third reaction begins in chapter 19, and it consists of four heavenly praises in verses 1 through 5. The first praise is one from the heavenly hosts. The text says, And after these I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So John is still viewing uh, this vision from earth. And he has seen the angel cast the stone into the water. And he listened to its explanation of, of the permanence of her destruction. So now he hears a voice, a loud voice, singular, from heaven, from a multitude. The singular voice means they're in unison. This is all being said together with one accord uh, from heaven. And who are they? Whose voice is it? Well, it's probably either angels or it's the saints who are in heaven or it's a combination of both. The text doesn't say more than that, but it's probably one of those two. And it's interesting, the first thing they say is hallelujah. Now, hallelujah is a transliteration of, from Hebrew, uh, that literally means praise the Lord. You praise the Lord. It's a command. Uh, and what a transliteration means, it's spelling out a Hebrew word in modern letters. So in John's time, it was Greek letters. In our time, it's English letters. So when you read those English words, you're actually speaking a Hebrew word, the way it sounds in Hebrew. And it's interesting because why did he do that? And in fact, the word hallelujah in the New Testament is only found in this chapter, in chapter 19. Uh, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's found mostly in the Psalms, uh, where there's even a section in the Psalms called the Hallel, which is a praise Psalms, which is Psalm 113 through 118. Uh, it's a famous section that is sung mostly at the Passover, but also at the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles at the end. And on both of those occasions and those Psalms, they focus on the themes of redemption, of deliverance, and of the wicked being destroyed and judged. And you can see the great parallel here. And there may be a connection between the specific pronunciation of, or transliteration of hallelujah, uh, making that tie that this is also uh, the, the destruction of Babylon is part of the redemption, the deliverance, and the destruction of, of the wicked, the deliverance of God's people, and the uh, destruction of the wicked. So uh, this call of praise uh, is spoken of and conveyed in the word hallelujah. And what follows is the content, the object, what is being praised. Uh, so the praise that is given to God is threefold. So I've uh, changed the outline of this and made it structurally, it looks like this. So salvation and glory and power, those three belong to our God. So salvation, that's the deliverance of his people from the destruction of Babylon, from her judgment. Now, it also implies that the people who are delivered from them, they are actually saved. They are delivered from from the wrath of God, period, from his end time wrath and from his current, present wrath uh, at, on earth during this time. And we saw that when he called out his people to leave in chapter 18. He's also praised for glory, for his glory. In that judgment, his characteristics of holiness and justice are demonstrated in Babylon's destruction. Thus, God's glory is shown by those actions. And then third, power. His ability and action is demonstrated in her destruction, specifically in his control over the nations and even in the beast's empire to bring about his purposes and to use them to bring about her destruction. So why should these be praised? Well, that's in verse 2. Because his judgments are true and righteous. They're true, meaning they're according to the facts. It's truthful. 
It's what it is in reality. And they're righteous, meaning they're just, they're fair. It's what is right. It's what should be. And what were the crimes, her crimes that he's judging? The answer is twofold, which says, for he has judged the great harlot who has corrupted the earth with her immorality. And secondly, he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So if you notice those two uh, reasons, those two crimes are parallel to what we just read at the end of 18. Where in 18, it's because of the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her were found the blood of the prophets and the saints. Same concepts. So he's just repeating that in different words. So let's look at those different words. First in verse 2, it says, the great harlot has, was corrupting the earth with her immorality. This is fascinating because the word for corrupting the earth, it means to ruin something with the implication of causing it to be corrupt and thus cease to exist. It shows that Babylon's existence, that false religion, was corrupting creation and moving it steadily in the wrong direction, towards destruction, towards death. And thus, that is a reason to rejoice because that's over. That aspect can never again bring people down and creation down away from God. It's ended. And then secondly, it's the murder of the saints. It says, he has avenged the blood of his, his slaves on her. And remember, uh, those who are God's slaves, his bondservants, those are people who are trying to proclaim, be that witness for God, who's trying to restore God's life and goodness to the earth uh, and bringing more people to God. She has removed that, or tried to remove that. God's people hate sin because it mocks God and they love righteousness because it exalts him. So we long for a world that's characterized by righteousness, by his holiness, by his justice. Uh, but that will only happen when Christ removes that sin and removes that cause that's destroying and re ruining creation. And thus he comes and it establishes his righteous kingdom. So in this judgment, there is rejoicing because that time is close. A major uh, reason for the, the corruption of the earth has been dealt with permanently. John then hears a second praise from the heavenly host in verse 3. It says, in a, in a second time, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Again, the same word for hallelujah, it urges the praise of God because of his permanent judgment, that that judgment will last forever. The idea or the image of smoke rising up is the image of a destroyed city after it's been captured and burned. And thus when it says it will rise up forever and ever, Unlike a normal earthly city that does end in its destruction because it's burnt up completely, this one shows its eternal punishment. And it, it's similar language to the coming judgment of the beast's followers, which we saw in chapter 14, where the smoke of their punishment, their torment, rises up forever and ever. Uh, it shows in the same vein those who are worshiping a false god, the false religion, uh, their destruction is eternal hell, eternal punishment. And this is a, a deliberate contrast to the words of uh, chapter 18 that said, And the kings of earth whom committed acts of immorality and lived sensually with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. And then in verse 17, And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as made their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning. When they saw her smoke, they mourned because they, they were united with her. They were one spirit with her. Their whole life, their hope, their purpose was all entwined with her, with her existence. So in her destruction, they had nothing. 
but the people and angels of God are united with Christ. Her destruction is rejoicing because it means that Christ will now fill, is about to fill the earth and bring about his kingdom. So it is a praise for the reminder that the old is gone and the new is about to come. Uh, it's, it's as if we're in the car uh, and mom or dad just started the car uh, because we're about to go to an amusement park. It's one step closer. We're, we're getting there. Uh, it's the starting of the car. Here, it's the same kind of concept. It's the, it's the step. and it, it, it's, it's coming. It's on its way. This is uh, the finality of it. So the next praise comes from a different group. It comes from, uh, the third praise comes from the heavenly authorities in verse four. Uh, the text says, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Now the 24 elders, those are the, the rulers of 24 orders of angels who minister to God. Uh, it's a heavenly parallel to the 24 orders of priests uh, found in Chronicles. And the four living creatures, these are the ones who are around the throne of God, who are extremely powerful. These are the ones that are continually crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. He's eternal. He's all powerful. And he's the holiest thing there is, being there is, person there is. And they fall down and worship. Uh, the judgment uh, of the harlot shows his act, and his act is spectacular, worthy of worship and a praise. And these most powerful of heavenly beings, creation, fall down in utter uh, humility and reverence before God. It shows, again, our example of, of those who are in perfect fellowship with God. This is what they do. So we who, who strive to be in perfect fellowship with God, that should also be our response, our reaction as well. So what do they say? They say amen. Now that's another transliteration from a Hebrew word. So when we say the words amen in English, we're actually pronouncing a Hebrew word, which means so be it, or it is true. It refers to that which is firm, fixed, unchanging. And so when the uh, 24 elders and the living creatures say amen. They are affirming the multitude who is praising God and saying that his, tr uh, praising God for his true and righteous judgment and for its permanence. So they say, yes, that is true. That is unchanging. That is fixed. So be it. That is what will happen. And then again, they repeat the call to praise God. This is praiseworthy. And thus it shows that there's no division in heaven. They're all of one mind, of one accord about this action and what God is doing. He's moving in creation. That is a great thing. Finally, the final praise, the fourth praise, is where John hears praise from the throne itself in verse 5. The text says, And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Now the voice here this throne, uh, this voice that came from the throne, that's the glorified Christ. Many commentators reject that idea that Christ would say, Our God. And thus they attribute it to a living creature or, or, or uh, someone else that's very close to the throne. But throughout the book of uh, Revelation, that which comes from the throne is that which sits on the throne. It comes from God itself. The last time we heard a voice from the throne was in chapter 16, which said, And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It's done. It is done, uh, which parallel Christ's words on the cross that is finished. Christ spoke those words, and he spoke these words as well. Uh, further, the, the glorified Christ 
has already spoken like this earlier in Revelation. We're in chapter 2. He said, For I have not found your, meaning Sardis's, deeds completed in the sight of my God. And then in uh, speaking to the church of Philadelphia, in, in verse 12, he says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God, and in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of, out of heaven from my God and my new name. So it's not unusual or not uh, odd that Christ, the voice of Christ from the throne, would say, our God. Uh, because it's always Christ's job, his work, it's the will of the Father for Christ to glorify and give praise to the Father, and thus to direct others to do the same. And here we see that. So we see in this, the four praises, we see an escalation. We see the heavenly hosts, whether they be angels, saints, or a combination. Then the leadership, or the authority, praising God. And now, from the very throne itself, the glorified Christ calling all to, to praise God, praise the Father. And in his command, it characterizes believers who are to praise him, or to praise God. And uh, there are five characteristics given here. And I want to go over those because... These characteristics of praise are things that we should be and things that we should be doing. And it, it describes us. They look like this. The first is to give praise to our God. But the first is a command. It's a present command, meaning it's something we should be continually doing. Our lives should be characteristic of praising. We are meant and created to praise Him to enjoy him and to such degree that we share it, we vocalize it. Our lives uh, proclaim his goodness and speak of his goodness. The question is, do we? Do we praise him? Uh, do we tell people of the things that we're learning, the things that he's doing in our lives, the things that he has done or things that we expect him to do uh, because he promises of his promises? Uh, we can share about our movie or a restaurant or, or some, uh, some other great thing, but do we share about the, great, the goodness of God in our lives? And are we praising him during the week beyond Sundays? Uh, Christ is telling us that uh, this should be a regular characteristic of our life, to praise him, to give praise to God. Secondly, it says our God. That's relational language. Uh, it's uh, the believers are one in relationship to the Father because we are one and in Christ. And Christ is one with the Father. So the question is, are we relating to the Father? Do we relate to Him each day? Are we in prayer with Him, speaking with Him continually uh, throughout the day? And are we reading His Word, His revealed revelation, so the Spirit can then speak through His Word to us? And to lead us and guide us through his word. Are we relating to him? Third characteristic is all you his bondservants, all you his slaves. This is slave and master language. And so we are characterized as his slaves. Those who conform our wills, our lives to the master's will. To our Lord's will. So the question then becomes again, do we conform our wills, our desires, and our actions, our behaviors, our lives to that of our masters? Knowing and recognizing whose home we live in, whose family we're in, the job we're supposed to be doing, his will. Uh, we are owned by him. We are not our own. We, bar we are bought with a price. The fourth char characteristic is you who fear him. Fearing him has the idea of reverence and respect and awe. It's not afraid of punishment because we know he loves us and love casts out all fear of punishment uh, in this aspect because he, he loved us because he died for us and Christ took that punishment. So we don't fear his wrath, but
But what do we fear? We're afraid of doing anything that might displease him or break our fellowship with him. Uh, and it's rooted and grounded in a proper idea of his character, his holiness, his graciousness, his transcendence, his, uh, the magnificence of God. And thus, the more we understand his character and in, in who he is, his loftiness, the more we see our lack, our lowliness, our sin. Uh, and that should bring fear. Do we live this? Do we have a correct view of who God is and thus who we are? And then finally, number five, uh, Christ characterizes us, the believers, who he's calling to praise is the small and the great. Now, this is a fascinating way of saying it uh, because it shows a diversity among his people of small and great. Now, small and great are labels given from an earthly perspective. Small, the common man, great, the leaders. The, but notice, whether you're in the small category or in the great category, there's great diversity, but all are equal before God. All are to give praise, are in relationship with, are all, over, all are his slaves, and all are to fear. In Christ, we're all one. There's no division. There's no separation. There's no partiality. So no matter who you are, these are uh, characteristics that, you, that should be displayed in your life. So there's great diversity in the body of Christ, but there's great e equality before God. And that wraps up the fourth praise uh, that's from the throne. So now let's move to applications and major points. The first one is that in God's judgment, He's removing that which corrupts the world, leads it in the wrong direction, and tries to extinguish his lights. His judgment reveals the deliverance of his people, his character of justice and holiness, and his power to bring about his will. These judgments are due in our in accordance with the facts. They're true. And in his judgments, God makes all things right. They're just. Praise him. And rejoice. Uh, these are words that are spoken to us of the future. It is not something that's hoped for or something that may happen. It's something that's sure. These will happen. And we can rejoice in that now. Number two, uh, the permanent removal of the harlot marks the vindication of the suffering of God's people and the coming of Christ's glorious and righteous rule on earth. Praise him for this hope. The things, the ways you've been persecuted, the ways that you've suffered at the hands of the wicked, that will not go unpunished. We are commanded not to take revenge and to let God do that um, because he may have a plan even for them. Uh, and that is, this passage shows that God is, a God of his word. He will judge. He will take uh, uh, vengeance. He will avenge the wrongs done uh, to his people. And he is that righteous judge where we are not. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. And he knows what place he has for these. Okay, number three, we are people who praise, uh, are we people who praise God? Do we relate to him each day, speaking to him and reading his word? being led by his spirit that's working through his word? Do we have a proper perspective of his exalted and glorious being and our united lowliness? Whichever aspect or characteristic uh, that you see is, is lacking in yourself, pray about it this week. Start off your day in, with saying, Lord, I don't fear you as I feel I, I ought to or I should. Help me to fear you more. Help me to see your character more. Or if you feel you're lacking in his lordship, of him directing and guiding your life, Lord, this week, please help me to realize my place, that I'm a slave, that I'm bought with you, and my life is, is designed to give you glory and praise in, on our, every aspect. Help me to obey you. Um, whatever characteristic that's off your relationship, Lord, I feel far away from you. I don't feel like I'm in a relationship with you. 
pray, Lord, give me that closeness, that intimacy, that, uh, that, that fellowship when I read your word and pray with you uh, that you've promised me through your spirit. Uh, call on these things and, and ask him for these things um, because that's what we're, we're designed and called to do. So that concludes uh, Revelation 18, 20 verse, uh, until 19, 5, which is heaven's reaction to judgment of the great harlot, which is a reaction of praise.